Welcome everybody to the Wheeler Centre tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Marnie Cordell, I'm the editor of Crikey. It's great to be here, I'm from Sydney, so I'm quite jealous of the Wheeler Centre. Um, I've often looked at the lineup and wished that I could turn up, so it's good to be here. I'm here tonight with Tony Wheeler, who is a publishing entrepreneur. He's a businessman, <laughs> a co-founder of the Lonely Planet Guidebook Company with his wife Maureen, and also, of course, the name behind the Wheeler Centre. Uh, welcome, Tony. Thank you. Laura Jean McKay uh, is the author of Holiday in Cambodia, which is a great little collection of short stories published by Black Ink, which has been described by novelist Stephen Carroll as polished Hemingway-esque snapshots. Oh, thanks, David. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> You get a clap for that. Her writing's also been published by Best Australian Stories, Sleepers, Almanac, The Big Issue, Women of Letters and The Lifted Brow. And finally, I'm here with Doug Hendry, who's a freelance foreign correspondent, magazine writer and lecturer at University of Melbourne. Uh, he's reported on everything from Australian sex surrogates to Kenya's internet startups and the rascal gangs in PNG. Doug is also the author of... <laughs> Doug is also the author of Amalgamations, which is actually the inspiration for tonight's event, um, and so we'll be discussing it a bit tonight. Amalgamations, which I read very quickly over the weekend, <laughs> is a book about the good side of globalisation. Uh, Doug travels to Indonesia, Korea, the Philippines and Ghana to discover that when globalisation is applied to culture as opposed to economics, it actually often has a positive net effect. So tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the cultural mashups, I guess, that result from different cultures arriving in different countries. Uh, we'll be discussing that. We'll also, of course, be looking at the hard questions about travel and travel writing. So do travellers treat other countries as theme parks? What responsibilities do visitors have? Does their presence help destroy cultures or enrich them? And are we, in fact, moving towards a homogenous global superculture? Which is a very big question, which we'll try to answer. <laughs> um, and if so, is that a good thing? So tonight, I'm going to start with an easy question to begin with, and I just thought I'd get you to, to open up a little bit about your own travel experiences. I'd like to start with you, Tony. Can you think of an event uh, or a cultural experience that you've seen uh, in another country of a culture embracing and adapting an experience from another culture and, and making a, causing a hybrid mashup of a, a, their own local cultural experience? I, I think a lot of the, the things that work in the developing world these days when we're looking at modern Western culture and so on uh, is mobile technology. And there are so many countries where the, the phone never got there, nobody ever had a landline, and boom, they've gone straight to mobile technology and you know the, the mobiles are everywhere and I've been around Afghanistan when you know you, you think is this going to possibly work and I met a young guy who'd grown up in a refugee camp in Pakistan come back to Afghanistan installed these mobile phone towers all over the country I ended up sitting next to him on a flight and I said but don't they get blown up by the Taliban and he said no the Taliban want mobile phones as well <laughs> so so you know there, there was a technology that both sides yeah. wanted and used and you know yeah. it was safe because both sides needed it and you go to Africa where in Kenya in particular a thing called M-Pesa which is a way of and it's way ahead of us of paying things over mobile phones mm. and they the somebody I spoke to about this was saying that you know most people don't have a don't have a bank account but they all have a mobile phone mm. and as a result in in Nairobi I think it's a figure like 90 percent or 95 percent of bus drivers and bus conductors and so on get their salary each week paid onto their mobile phone. It goes straight to their mobile phone. And they can then pay things off their mobile phone and send right. money to other people with mobile phones way ahead of us. So the mobiles are actually acting as a credit card? or a It's a credit card. It's a bank. Wow. It really upset the banks, but they just <laughs> jumped over their heads. Interesting. Um, Laura, so a particular way of doing things that you've seen embraced by a local community? Mm. Uh, I worked with a writer's centre in Phnom Penh in 2009 and uh, a lot of the writers there had really embraced short fiction and short essay writing. Traditional Cambodian 
uh, writing and poetry is sung. I won't give you an example. Um, sung and and goes on for a very long time and it's it's very beautiful and there are only about, I think, about 12 ways of doing it. You can only write these 12 poems. And so the short story culture and the essay culture was quite new and people were embracing this really passionately. They were getting death threats from the government and um, we were on tour um, with a writer's group and... We went up to Badambong, which is in the centre of the country, and we'd organised a, a gig at one of the cultural centres there, and we arrived and they said, oh, no, no, um, you know, you, you don't have a gig here tonight. And we said, oh, we've, we've organised this for months. And, and they said, no, please go away, I'm going to lose my job, you know. Mm. Um, so it had been cancelled by the government. Um, but the writers just kept on writing. They were getting death threats, they were getting their gigs cancelled and they just wouldn't stop. They were so passionate about this modern form of writing. Mm. Mm. Doug, your book is all about these kind of cultural mashups. What's your favourite that you've come across? Uh, I reckon the one that probably grabs people's attention is the um, professional video gaming uh, industry in South Korea, which didn't exist back in um, 1998. Uh, and then a game called StarCraft came out, which is a real-time strategy game, hugely popular in America, but sort of you know, um, went up and went down and people moved on to something else. Everywhere in the world except for Korea, where people just sort of latched onto it and perfected it. So it was an Amer- it's an American game. You know, um, the main, the main, one of the main races is the Terrans, who, you know, say, who speak in you know, sort of classic southern drawl, um, and then they're fighting against two you know, alien races. Um, but in Korea, it's been taken up and turned into a full industry where, where um, the top players get, play, uh, get paid probably a quarter of a million, half a million dollars a year to play a video game professionally. Uh, add, add to that sponsorships, corporate deals uh, and, and celebrity. Uh, there are actual video game groupies um, as well. <laughs> uh, and you start to wonder what exactly is going on. And then came the TV channels. So there's two TV channels showing these sort of games uh, nonstop. And nothing like this ever happened uh, in America. Uh, where the game was originally birthed uh, and, and sort of, you know, and petered out. Uh, and it got to the point where Blizzard, the manufacturer of the game, was determined when they finally released the, the sequel uh, second time around, they're like, this is extraordinary. It's just sort of happened without any input from us uh, that they turned this into uh, an industry. Uh, and they were determined to rest it back and sort of lay, lay claim because um, the organisers in Korea never paid a, a red cent um, <laughs> uh, beyond the actual, you know, the cover price of the game. But in doing so, by, by clamping down on the intellectual property, Blizzard ended up, ended up killing that sort of unexpected hybrid, uh, and StarCraft II was never remotely as successful uh, in Korea. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that one tends to grab people's attention because it is, it's, a, it's such an individualistic game. You know, it's one player versus another player on some sort of... You build a base, your opponent builds a base, you, you destroy your opponent's base. You know, it's one versus one. But yet it's been given this really distinctive Korean twist where... Um, uh, when you, when you praise someone for their successes uh, on the, in the game, they'll sort of distribute praise across the team, like, oh, no, it wasn't me, it was the team, it was the coach. And you're like, no, 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 I, I saw you up there, it was you clicking the buttons, you were on the mouse, you're doing stuff like faster than what I could see, and they're like, no, no, it's, I, I had very little to do with it. And it's, just like, <laughs> it's extraordinary. You know, sort, of, so, mm. sort of collectivising this sort of really hyper-individualistic game. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so you seem to argue, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I think you seem to argue in the book that it's not necessary to protect local cultures and that it's almost patronising to suggest that we need to protect local cultures from Western influence or Western or other influences. Um, you know, that there's no danger of being, them being overrun or overtaken by Western cultural influence. Instead, in your experience, people are sort of taking what they like, running with it and leaving the rest. Are there any examples or situations, though, where that's not the case? Certainly, um, uh, particularly so uh, where income inequality is, is greatly different. So um, I'm guided by, there's a, there's a book from 2002 called Creative Destru- Destruction, which sort of lays out the economics of the, this sort of side of culture um, and that, this sort of transfer. And the author points out that Pacific Islands in particular did very badly out of um, the early sort of globalisation wave of the 19th century. You know, most, you know, a great, great wave of devastation took place, you know, um, local religions replaced by Christianity and so on and so forth, languages and so on. Mm. So where the, the balance is so far skewed, um, where you have you know, Western power versus these t- you know, tiny island states, which collectively were quite powerful, they had trading empires, but individually as islands ha- had not, nothing such, um, then, then definitely, yeah, Western culture can be devastating because it's able to be projected. Um, 
efficiently uh, and with, with extraordinary sort of um, uh, speed and power, and it's also attractive for a great many people. But I suppose what I'm arguing in my book is that um, middle-sized countries and, and countries where, it's, where the middle class is increasingly growing, you know, from Brazil, South Africa, Russia, uh, obviously China and India, mm. uh, cultures are more than strong enough to sort yeah. of take on board Western influence, tweak it, uh, or just or just ignore it entirely. And um, you make the Hollywood Bollywood comparison, yeah. which is very true about India, isn't it? Yeah. Hollywood doesn't get a look in. <laughs> no, or unless it's to be copied and, to, and added, you know, song and dance routines added, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then you have you have Nollywood as well, and Hong Kong cinema for China. So you have these sort of uh, major film industries that are kind of they sometimes they borrow from Hollywood, sometimes they're shamelessly derivative, but often they just move in a totally mm. different direction yep. as well. Tony, you've sent plenty of Western tourists into remote. Places. Have I ruined them all? <laughs> <laughs> You've probably been responsible for a whole lot of intercultural communication and interaction. So what are your thoughts? I, I think cultures are stronger than we think. That We sometimes think that you know, we, we go there and we bring all these, these influences and, and money and things. And yet, you, know, you, you go to Bali, which is a, an example of a place where the, the cultural influence, particularly the number of tourists, is, is huge. And of course, tourists aren't the only things. You know, Indonesia has changed dramatically in lots of other ways as well. It wouldn't. It isn't just tourism that have changed things. But in, in Bali, you know, the, the kids still learn to play the gamelan. They still do the dances, and you you see the the old the older people sort of teaching them. You hold your hand this way. You do that, and they're paying attention because it's mm. it's really important to them. You see them going off to the the dances in the evening on the back of a motorcycle. So the, these things are stronger than we think, and. I, I've done talks where I've said, look, you know, here's a country, I've, I've ruined Bali through Lonely Planet, and then I've ruined Cambodia, and <laughs> then we did a book on this, and we ruined that. And Well, we did a guidebook on Afghanistan, and I would really like to ruin Afghanistan. <laughs> you know, when they come along and say, oh, Afghanistan was going fine until Lonely Planet did a guidebook, and send all those tourists, and look at it now. You know, that, that would be a, a real pleasure. <laughs> Has, has there ever, ever been a situation, though, where you've decided not to publicise a place for that reason? And not to not, to not publicise, but to, you, you really very often... This is my... I mean, I'm not, I'm not connected with Lonely Planet anymore. I'm sure. gone for a number of years. But we, we were very aware that in some places you do have too much influence. Hmm. And the influence... It, it's fine recommending a restaurant in Melbourne. You know, the Age is going to say one thing, the Herald Sun is going to say something else a dozen radio stations and all sorts of other influences are going to tell you about things. And the fact that Lonely Planet says this is a really good restaurant in Melbourne doesn't really have any... It just plays another minor part. But in places where everybody is using the guidebook, Vietnam, for example, mm. you saying this is the best restaurant in town, you must eat there, is going to make that one too popular and kill everything else. So You're I really think, changing the local economy at that point. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, we, we, we learnt how to, to be careful with it. And mm. I've told our authors, you know, if you feel you have too much influence in a place, then say, well, that's quite a nice restaurant, but so is this one, and that one's good as well, and not heap too much praise on one place. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mind, mind you, I did hear that in Vietnam in particular, when, when Lonely Planet would sort of bestow an accolade on one restaurant, there'd be a, a sea of imitations, and then sort of down the street they'd be like, you know, <laughs> yeah. number two, number three, number Such four, number five. Slightly different names, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah slightly <laughs> different names. This was also in some places where it was a tax advantage, you know. You oh, did right. really well as the, the something restaurants, then you reopened as the new something <laughs> restaurant and <laughs> start, started again from, from day one. Yeah, but we, well, one of our funniest stories in, in, in Vietnam was we had a right... The writer came back and the new edition came out and we started getting letters from people saying, I paid to have my restaurant recommended, why don't I get a... Mm. And we, we pulled the writer in and said, you're not supposed to do that, you know. And it, he hadn't. He'd, had a, he'd, he'd got a driver who was taking him around and mm. after the, you know, he'd written up the, whatever he was doing about the restaurant and the driver would then go over and present the invoice. <laughs> and, and I thought it was very Vietnamese, you know, there's a... A market opportunity, go in there and get it. <laughs> um, what about you, Laura? Have you come across any examples of it going disastrously wrong for a local community to have an influx of Westerners? Mm. Um, many times, really. I've spent a little bit of time in Bali in the last year and um, my partner actually um, tells a really great story where he heard an Indonesian 
author saying that he went to a restaurant in Bali and um, admired the view, which was of a small field and a man industrious, industriously ploughing the field. Very nice, very industrious. Um, and he came back to this excellent restaurant about two or three months later and saw the man still ploughing the field. <laughs> and he said to the owner, has the crop turned around so quickly? Did they sort of grow it and harvest it? And the owner said, oh, no, no, he never, he never grows a crop. He just ploughs the field for the tourists because they like it. <laughs> yeah. I just think that is extraordinary. And apparently in Bali, I mean, this is all, this is all hearsay, but um, offerings are now being put out at a different time of the day, not at dawn when all the tourists have a hangover mm. but you know at around 10 or 11 when the tourists are just starting to wander down the street to buy some silk sure yeah you've just fed seamlessly into my next question oh, without meaning to. to so i was going to ask about this term i think that you mentioned in your book doug uh bastardized commodities is there a danger of cultural practices turning into bastardized commodity commodities and you give the example of balinese dancers performing for tourists um, is this is this a real danger or is it an oversimplification? Well, one of my favourite travel writers, um, Pico I, went to Bali and wrote uh, t- when he was writing his book, Video Night in Kathmandu, which was um, came out in 1988. And he, he his original um, concept for that book was is like right, Western culture is destroying the East, uh, and so that was his original preconception. And he went out to um, to figure out whether that whether or not that was true, and he ended up feeling distinctly ambivalent about it by the end. So he had him wasn't totally disproven, but it wasn't wasn't um, uh, he sort of sat on the fence. But in Bali, what he found was that there was actually a rebirth of interest in Balinese dance and so on, because the young young people weren't necessarily getting into it. But now all of a sudden, you had a massive new uh, market for it. You know, you had you had your t- hotel to, um, hotel shows at six thirty p.m. Mm-hmm. You had a sort of a, a, a regular income from it that would that would supplement your your the dances you might do at temples and so on. And so he ended up with quite a distinctly ambivalent sense about it. So tourism mm-hmm. had sort of led to a rebirth of interest in many of these traditional arts, uh, at, and at the same time, to some degree, bastardised them, turned them into sort of um, sort of snipped versions of themselves because no, you know, tourists might not have the patience to sit through a five-hour performance, but mm. 45 minutes greatest hits of Balinese dance <laughs> of the last 3,000 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I reckon I can, I can fit one in before my first bintang. Uh, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But there, there, true. Are, there are lots of places where, tour, you know, we, we need tourism. I think Africa is an example. Mm. You know, that, that elephant, it's just something that rips up your crops unless you can make money out of it because tourists are coming there. Mm. And I think, you know, we'd, we'd, we've got enough problems keeping animals alive in Africa as it is. We'd have a huge amount more problem if it wasn't for the tourists wanting to see them. Mm. And I think, you know, there's a, certainly an element of that in Bali of, of art, painting, which has really flourished because of um, the, the, the demand for it by tourists. Balinese gardens. You know, they, they, you, don't, you don't just see Balinese gardens in Bali anymore. There are... Balinese gardeners who go and put them in hotels and um, embassies and things all over Asia. They've, they've, they export their gardens. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess what we're saying is that the cultural globalisation can't always be separated from the economic. Mm. As a businessman, are you concerned about economic globalisation? No, because I, I think, you know, we, we, we worry that we're all wearing Nike shoes and driving Toyota cars and using our Apple phones. But... The, 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 the intrinsic part of culture stays strong despite that. Hmm. You know, we, we love these photographs of people in their local attire, but still using the, still using the iPhone. Yeah. So, Laura, plenty of people think that they travel to experience difference, but I think in your book um, what you're really showing is characters who don't necessarily want to be taken out of their, their comfort zones. What experiences were you drawing on to build those characters? An excellent question, Marnie. Um, <laughs> and difficult. <laughs> um, I, I suppose with, with Holiday in Cambodia, all I really had to draw on was my experience as a Western aid worker um, at best, um, expatriate, tourist uh, at the very worst. So I tried to look at it from that angle. Mm. And I wanted... 
uh, I wanted to sort of destabilize the power, I suppose. I feel that we come to these countries as these all-conquering um, tourists um, wielding our dollar and and our visa and our passport, which you know we really take for granted, but um, which a lot of people that I know in Cambodia could never get a hold of. Maybe some dollars, but certainly not a passport. Um, or a visa. So I wanted to destabilise that and I wanted to, and this is something that I'm increasingly interested in, in looking at the tourist not as a tourist, which is the way we consider ourselves, but as a guest in another person's country. Mm. And, um, you know, you know, guests, they can be wonderful, they bring some new music on their iPod, maybe they bring a casserole, then they stay for too long. They're a pain <laughs> in the ass. You have to clean up for them. They use too many towels. They question the way you live. <laughs> <laughs> and and I suppose that's something that I, I was aiming for. Using um, myself as a primary example, um, in the book it, it probably seems a little blamey, but really the person that I'm blaming is myself. And one of the harshest stories in the collection is called The Expatriate. And I'll admit, admit this to you good people now, <laughs> <laughs> that it is actually based on um, uh, my experience mm. of a day when I was probably a little bit hungover in a way that only an expatriate can get. Um, Do you want to give us a quick recap of the story? Uh, so, <laughs> so the woman in the story is an amalgamation. Um, of of um, of all the the awful women <laughs> that I met um, while in Cambodia, and she goes out uh, one very hot day to buy a plane ticket, and she sits in that plane office for two hours and they just can't sort it out and the computer's broken and so she gets on the friggin motorbike, which is old and slow and goes out to the airport and tries to buy a ticket and the woman stuffs up the ticketing and overcharges her by $130. And the woman makes the, the airport lady, who probably earns about $30 a month, pay $30 that she's overcharged her. Mm. And I'm afraid this is very, very <laughs> close to the truth. And I, I think that's what the experience that probably made me leave Cambodia and not go back and mm. seek employment there because I found myself turning into this creature that was just, yeah, just a, a horrific slimy sort of, you know, something from the deep lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you don't do something wrong at some point, you know, you've obviously had too easy a life because there are, there are things you, and you think, oh, why did I do that? Oh, God. <laughs> When have you ever yeah. felt like a slimy lagoon monster? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do. Don't, don't, I don't want to think about it. Give please. us an example. <laughs> no, but seriously, have you ever felt found yeah, yourself doing? Oh, look, exactly doing, those sort of same situations. Yeah, of. you know, and you, and it, and you know, afterwards, you. I mean, at the time, you think, oh God, you know, it was their fault. This sort of thing, and, and later on, you think, oh shit, why did I do it? And later, later, you think, well. These things happen. Mm. But I suppose it's when we make these little mistakes and, you know, what's $30 between friends? But when you start to think about the value of 30 bucks mm. in, in, a, in mm. different cultures, it, um, you sort of start to see the dominoes yeah. start to collapse in, the, in that awful way. Mm. Um, you know, what about her, her family? What about... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever felt like an unwanted guest in another country, Doug? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, I lived in Japan for about seven months, um, and that that was a fascinating experience because it's it's ninety nine percent one ethnicity, uh, mm. and that wasn't me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so, it, and a lot of the expats that I hung out hung out with, which I think was was the danger, is that you sort of only hang out with expats, and you end up having, living in this sort of weird little bubble of people who can, you know, either have this sort of fluctuating love hate relationship with a country that's their host. Mm. Um, and, and, yeah, can produce um, bad behaviour. So uh, did, did I... Yes, I, yeah, I, I found that Japan warped me in, in weird ways. I found that my personality was much more malleable than I'd previously thought, mm. and I didn't necessarily like the new version that was emerging. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit of a jerk in Japan, I have to say. I, I was drunk on trains. Actually, I was drunk a lot. Um, 
Well, went, after midnight, everybody else is. Yeah, that's true. I blended in after that point, but until that point, there was, there was, a, bit of a, there was a bit of a gap. Um, and Jerk I worked in at Japan a tr- is actually a really good book title. What's that? Jerk in Japan is actually a really great <laughs> book title. Well, right, that's my, that's my difficult second book. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't sell as well as the first. No. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, no. I think the expatriate uh, condition, I think, tends to tends to produce bad behaviour. I reckon. I mean, they say that travel broadens the mind, but I think it can mm. also also shrink it uh, in the sense it can sort of lead you to strengthen stereotypes that you have, and you you, like, you come to become a, you can become accustomed to having small, friendly people who are paid one thirtieth of your of your wage looking after your every need, and that becomes naturalised and normalised. You know, you hear horrific, horrific stories of um, people in Dubai. You know, Westerners in Dubai just living very bad, you know, very badly with, um, um, well, subcontinental labour it would be in, in Dubai. Yeah. Um, mm. So, oh, without a doubt, I think um, I've done it. And I think it, the longer you stay there, um, the worse it gets. So I'd actually, even though I'm sort of arguing the, the, the strengths of travel as a, a, you know, and sort of this, this sort of interaction, I think limiting it, I think, is also, is also mm. key. Yeah, mm. would be my thing. If you stay too long, that's when, yeah... Yeah. But, but Japan's a particular example where everybody loves Japan at first mm. and then they sort of have this reversal mm. of um, how they feel about it. Mm. And as you say, it is a place where you're, you're a, a separate group as an expat, but mm. a strange place. I felt as though my personality started splitting. Um, mm. I was working in a, in, a, um, in a place called the Buddhist Institute with, with writers and next door to, to the Buddhist Institute was a place called Naga World, which was the casino. <laughs> and the people at the Buddhist Institute, I think very intentionally, kept saying to me, don't go to Naga World, it's built on land that people were evicted from, it's taking money from Cambodian people, it's owned by, you know... I don't know, um, it's a Chinese-owned company, they're evil, bad, bad, bad. And I was like, yes, yes, never going to Naga World. And then at night, I'd hang out with my expat friends and I'd be like, oh, Naga World, Naga World though. <laughs> and he's got big snakes at the front and they hand out drinks when you come in. It's awesome. <laughs> but I never went with, to with Naga With an apple as well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I never went to Naga World, but I have to admit, part of me still wants to go there. <laughs> Isn't there a place called Naga Land? Which yeah. is like an ethnic minority, oh. no? no? Is it in, traditional in India, land? In India, there is a Nagaland. Ah, Naga right. Land. The, the Naga yeah. is a, a snake. Yeah, a snake. It, yeah, be, yeah. It, it means snake. <laughs> Have any of you ever been confronted by someone about your privilege or about, you know, what are you doing here? Have you ever been asked that by a source or... You know, I, I, uh, this, this is sort of trying to drag up the bad behaviour things, isn't it? And, That's what I'm you know, I, I, a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Squirmy a bit here. Yeah, <laughs> no. The, the, the rent of motorcycles, which you've um, taken down two bad roads, or uh, t- too many vehicles I've taken down roads, and some, you know, an Avis doesn't always like it either. <laughs> yeah. So you haven't been confronted? Well, I think I was confronted not, um, not, not in such a, um, an upfront way, but um, when I first arrived in Cambodia in 2007, um, I hopped in a car and I was a, a volunteer aid worker and um, and the the person who was hosting me was driving the car and, and I was looking around saying, oh, this is a lot like Vietnam, isn't it? And, you know, sort of glare, <laughs> was glared at in the rear vision mirror. Don't say Vietnam. And I said, oh, so where do you go on holiday? And I sort of felt the car sort of... <laughs> an idiot. <laughs> I felt the car sort of, you know, jolt a bit. And he said, I've never been on holiday. And this was a man who was the head of, you know, an international... of Australia's international aid program in Cambodia. And he'd never been on holiday because most people don't go on holiday. And sadly mm. enough, this was enough to rock my little, my little world. And... and I realised then that I was I was dealing with a level of poverty that um, that I didn't know existed, and that I'd lived for almost thirty years without knowing without knowing that you know um, right in my face, and it was a bit of a shock. Sure, Doug. Good good thing to encounter that though. I think oh, that's one of the things you know. Essential. So many people never encounter it, hmm. and those of us who do travel do come up against that, and that's a good experience. Yeah. yeah. We had a bit of a discussion backstage about whether these cultural experiences are one way and Tony, you had some strong feelings on that. You think that absolutely not, they're not one way, even though some people have the money to travel into places and others don't. 
Well, I, I mean, the people who, who bring the cultures the other way don't necessarily come there like tourists, but they certainly come the other way. And I, I think we, we can see this in Australia, that we, we, we're not eating the, the mono, monoculture in food that we would have done in our parents' era. You know, you, you go out now and there's every food under the sun available there, and some of that we may have brought back, but an awful lot more of it has just come in by itself. And there's, I, I was saying, you know, I, I was in Paris last year and traveling on the metro and came up out of one metro station and I, it was as if I'd been dropped in the middle of Africa, that there were, all well, the barber shops had those um, signs that if you traveled around Africa you're familiar with, of sort of paintings of the hundred different <laughs> men's hairstyles. You know, God, I can't believe people get their hair cut so often to support all the barber shops there are in Africa. Um, th that sort of thing. And then the, the food, the music, everything else. And... So many countries which, if you went back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, would have been monocultures are not anymore, mm. whether anywhere in Europe and certainly, certainly Australia. So it's probably more about immigration than, than travel for it, it's more a holiday It's more immigration rather. Although we get lots of, um, you know, you don't have to just be on a two-week holiday to be a tourist. You know, you can be here for two years doing um, studying in, in Melbourne. And, but you're effectively a, a visitor in that two years. You're going back to your country afterwards. But you're bring. I was just reading about um, someone opening a cat cafe in Melbourne. <laughs> that you know you can go and pay ten dollars an hour to. And part of the idea behind this, okay. it's yeah crazy, was uh, for Asian students who are here and in, to, to discourage them from buying a cat for the year they're here, and then when they go back to Singapore, dumping it out the front door because it served its purpose and don't need it anymore. Well, this, this cafe is going to you know, be a reason you don't have to do that. You can just come and have an hour of a cat, <laughs> when, you need, a cat. when you need a cat. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> well, there's a culture introduced to Melbourne we didn't think about. <laughs> Doug, is there anything innately colonial about travel writing? Ah, uh, well... After spending three years doing my PhD on exactly that topic, I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> I didn't even know that. That was not a setup. Um, um, historically, yes. Uh, present day, not as much. That would be my short version. Okay. Uh, but yeah, historically, travel writing was a vehicle of empire. It was used as a way to sort of justify the reason to go out because without people back home knowing about the sort, the poor benighted condition of, of these pagan heretic, I don't know, whatever else, what other, other adjectives you can add on top, um, what, what was the you know, moral imperative to go out and colonise the world as, as Europe did? Um, so travel writing was very much part of um, uh, the European colonial push. But uh, in present day, I think that has been... It's still, it's still present to some degree. Uh, and so um, if you read someone like uh, Paul Thoreau, for instance, um, who grew up in Africa when it was still... Um, where parts of it were still under European rule. And then he went back there for his book, Dark Star Safari, uh, when he travelled, um, you know, uh, Cairo to Cape Town. Uh, and it's, you have that sense of the fall. He's like, you know, you can, you can, it's, he never, never says it anywhere, but he, it's very clear that he feels like that Africa has gone backwards. Uh, and those sort of, those sort of uh, ways of writing about non-Western countries are still, are still present to some degree, especially when people dwell on the exotic. And to some degree, I mean, if you think about it, travel writing has to manufacture a need to go because why go somewhere else if it's all the same if it's just if it's you know best western hotels and mcdonald's mm -hmm. so you have to sort of accentuate and, and to some degree manufacture that difference and that can lead to kind of to some bad behavior um in terms of turning um you know non-western people into ciphers that sort of summarize you know the sort of the, 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 happy, the happy taxi driver who takes you everywhere and is the best person or the, the evil taxi driver who's also the, mm. worst, per, is the worst person and very little in between. You know? mm. um, but I think, yeah, I, I reckon there are promising signs uh, in terms of travel writing becoming a, a, better, a better genre than it, than it was, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, and if nothing else, then from the fact that people start... Um, Western money travellers are vulnerable. You know? So the... You know, um, one of the sort of academic papers I looked at sort of charted that how, uh, you know, there was that sense of um, ownership where, where Europeans travelled in the 19th century and then that's totally gone by the mid-20th century um, as, as the sort of decolonisation took place because it's, it's gone. Empire's gone uh, and as a result you are acutely aware that you are white, you have money and that um, you are alone or travelling in, in a small group. As Tony, you, you would have find out, found out in um, your last two books which chart 
you know, some of the more dangerous places on earth. And I can imagine only more so because um, you stand out like a sore thumb. Right? <laughs> Not to sort of, you know... But, but sometimes you're very... Especially you know, in that they're, jacket. They're, yeah. <laughs> I, I never travel with this one, only in Melbourne. <laughs> Incognito. But yeah, sometimes, you know, you, you, you realise they're so delighted to see you. And Afghanistan's an example. You know, in Af- I've only been to Afghanistan twice, once in the 70s, when, you know, Afghanistan was having a sort of tourist boom, in effect... Mm-hmm. And more recently, when <clears throat> tourists were very few and far between, and the, so many people there could remember back to those days and would just love to turn the clock back. That was great back then. You know, we, we sold lots of carpets. Mm-hmm. Mm. Something I really enjoyed about your book, Laura, is how dark it is. Thank you. <laughs> we, we've all accused her of that tonight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's deliciously dark. Yeah. Um, could you have written the same book as a non-fiction, do you think? Uh, I, I don't think so, um, first and foremost, because I'm not a very good non-fiction writer. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, Cam- Cambodia, to me, does seem like a, a very dark place from, from my view, and going there as a, a tourist or an aid worker, um, I, I was straight into quite a dark side of Cambodia. Um, I was working with children who were HIV positive and then going straight from there to talk to um, women who were clearing landmines because the rest of their family had, you know, were missing limbs and so... And and I was going around the country doing this, so I did see a very dark side to Cambodia and I was also writing non-fiction stories for the aid world and I suppose I didn't feel that I could... um, that I could say the things that I needed to say I- I- through non-fiction. I, mm. felt, I felt that I needed to sort of inhabit the characters. And that there's a whole, a whole lot of... There's a, there are a whole lot of problems with that in itself, with a white woman writing from a Cambodian woman's perspective. And I did my master's thesis on that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we you did it very well at like. times. Though. You really, you really <laughs> yeah, sort of felt for those, yeah. some of the characters you created. Eh? Mm. Hmm. Well, um, the, the best moment with my collection, I think, was when I went to Cambodia and launched it there and asked um, a writer that I really love, um, Chari Fo. Uh, to launch it and and she very quickly read the collection over a weekend Mm. and her perspective on it was just so wonderful there's a very dark story in there um, about three men who go to a dance club and and pick up women and and pay them Mm. to sleep with them and you know I always thought oh that's such a nasty story nobody likes it my grandma read it and was really (laughs) traumatised you know (laughs) awful stuff and Chaudhia said, oh, in her speech, oh, that hilarious story about those guys who go to the club. And I thought, um, you know, what is love, love in Cambodia? $25. <laughs> you know? And she just brought a whole other perspective and yeah. um, a sense of humour to the collection that, that I, I don't know that I realised might have been there. And I was very relieved. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in, in Cambodia, they're saying, this is a really bright book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Something dark about it. Yeah, that that satirical, humorous collection. (laughs) Doug, your book is based on quite a difficult premise, really, which is how globalisation is good. Is there anything you felt you had to leave out because it didn't fit with the narrative? Well, like a a longer title, something like globalisation is quite ambivalent, but on the... On the whole, I think it kind of leans positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I tried putting that on the cover and yeah, they no, didn't go. Yeah, for didn't that. go for that. Yeah. yeah so, sure. um, is there any negatives that I have to lay out? Well, certainly, like, yeah, my body. It is interested. quite a positive story. I mean, they are mm. each quite engaging, positive stories about how it has worked. Mm. Um, well, maybe the Philippines chapter is the most complex because mm. so I'm, in the Philippines, I'm talking about. Um, why it is that Asia's only Catholic majority country and deeply Catholic to the point where they reenact the crucifixion every year uh, with real nails and real blood and, my God, um, is Asia's most gay-tolerant country. Like, how on earth did that come to be? So I went there, um, a straight little white boy, to try to figure out um, why that was. And I found that, yeah, an enormous amount of hybridity and adaptation had taken place uh, so that um, there there was a sort of culturally acceptable niche that was kind of immune to any sort of persecution by the church because gays were hairdressers and gays were comedians and those were sort of much loved 
essential professions <laughs> that no one could touch. So the church kind of left them alone. And that was, that was outwardly gay men. And then closeted gay men um, could do anything. They could be the president. They could, you know, they could rise the ranks in business and so on. Mm. But things were more difficult if you're a lesbian, if you're a transgender. You know? So women um, uh, you know, with the nuclear family, family, the Catholic nuclear family, they had to sort of raise their children. So lesbianism was, was much harder. And it was also much harder for people who couldn't, uh, perform that personality to different to different aspects. So a lot of people just had said one thing and did another. So on Sunday they go to church and then they they see their um, their secret lover, um, yeah, mm. that night, that type of thing. But for for pious true believer Catholics uh, with with same sex attraction, uh, yeah, life was life was pretty hellish. So there were an enormous number of stories that were examples of hybridity and sort of making it work and sort of being gay and Catholic or sort of rejecting Catholicism or joining one of the sort of gay splinter churches that have emerged there. Mm. Uh, but there are a lot of losers out of it too. So that was probably the most ambivalent chapter uh, yeah. in the sense that people were having to do it individually, you know, um, you know make that negotiation themselves. Sure. But on another one, um, uh, Bali, uh, the Indonesian chapter, where I'm looking at why it is that punk uh, is kind of dead everywhere but still massive in Indonesia. Mm. Uh, Bali is where... Um, Bali is home to Indonesia's largest punk band, Superman is Dead. And they got the idea from all the Western tourists, the surfers who used to hang around smoking weed on Kuta, Kuta Beach, uh, who would stay for months at a time and sort of swap tapes uh, and so on and so forth. So punk, that was one of punk's entry points, was through cassette tapes brought there by, mm-hmm. by Westerners. And now punk, when you hear it, Indonesian punk, they sing in Bahasa. Um, they, sing, they often sing um, deeply anti-authoritarian things. So when Suhado was there, they would sing against him, but in code. Uh, they would sing against the military, but you know, kind of safely. So mm. it was like a safe way to rebel. And it's not punk. The actual music is not punk like no. I've heard it before. Like yeah. it's quite, it's odd. It's like folk, folk punk at yeah. times. <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, it, it blew my tiny mind when I, when I was like, I was like, this feels familiar and yet not really familiar at all. Where yeah, am I? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was probably more, one of the more positive aspects because um, there wasn't that sort of musical genre of just pure anger or rage or, or outrage before, you know. Yeah. So it, it filled a niche, basically, and then they could fill it with their own ideas. And, and so, and it's a, I would argue, a really successful hybrid. So, mm. yeah. The, the music thing is really interesting because the same sort of <laughs> thing happened to, in Cambodia in the 60s where... Surf rock. Surf rock, Cambodian yeah. surf rock. Oh, my goodness. So amazing. Um, so the GIs over in Vietnam, the American GIs, were, were playing um, some pretty amazing music and often anti-war music. And it filtered over the border into Cambodia and people picked it up on their transistor radios. And it just it just grew into this incredible Cambodian surf rock scene. <laughs> and, you know, there were these golden voices and they were the superstars of Cambodia. Um, but in the same, and this was sort of happening throughout the 60s, and then, so while they're sort of taking on this American music and really running with it, then in 1969, America bombed the border of Cambodia to try and get the Viet Cong out and, um, and pretty much sort of started the Khmer Rouge, really. Um, Mm. You know, uh, it was the impetus that the Khmer Rouge needed to sort of rise and and take over Cambodia. So on one hand, you've got this this quite beautiful anti-war sentiment and Mm. and this this mixing, but then on the other hand, your country's getting bombed. On that note, I think I might open up to questions. I think it's nearly seven over there. So um, we've got people in the audience with mics. And if you just raise your hand and they'll come over to you with the microphone. Oh, hi. Yep. Uh, one thing I was curious about is the, the kind of feedback loop that happens with um, Westerners going to especially Asian places like, um, and taking on those qualities of kind of like the white yogi thing in mm-hmm. Bali and, mm-hmm. and really entrenched aid workers and things like that. Do, wh- what do you guys think about that cultural anomaly that kind of happens. Any computer game people, you know, getting in and becoming a Korean, um, did that, that happen at all? Yeah, there was a couple of, there was a couple of Anglos there, uh, but they weren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Their fingers didn't move fast enough? Or? Yeah, well, pretty much, well, they just didn't have the stamina, it was 14 hours a day, like, I mean, <laughs> the hardiest of hardcore geeks here is just, you know, paltry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... But on that, yeah, I think it's. I wonder whether you could draw a line between the the hippie trail, where people would sort of would try to go local and try to sort of immerse themselves. Partly that was a function of poverty, so hippies didn't have that much money, and so you'd do it as cheaply as possible. You'd live locally, eat locally, and so on. And to some degree, rising wealth in the West and the sort of the travel 
transition that's taking place there means increasingly we kind of travel as a pack. You got a big group of people. You go with, or you go with your family, or or for like a bucks week, you know, weekend or something like that. And I don't think it lends itself as much to um, to those kind of things anymore. So that's I suppose one of the disappointments I think um, with travel is that it's it's perfectly possible to travel in a bubble uh, and within a, within a group. Yeah, I don't know what you got. Of course, we see this not just in the developing world. I mean, all the the British gap year kids who come mm. over to... I actually got phoned up once by a, a British newspaper because there'd been a... a some, some backpacker had been... Um, actually been killed in a fight in a bar. Mm. And um, they phoned me up and said, you know what, could you, could you say something about is it safe for British backpackers to come to Australia? Um, and, I, and I looked up what had happened and the fight was between two Brits. <laughs> they'd, come, <laughs> they'd come all the way to Australia, got drunk in a bar... You know, and fought to the death in a bar. And, you know, it's, so what, what do you say? You know, you, well, they could have stayed home and had the fight. They didn't have, to, <laughs> didn't have to come here to do it. Something that I always wanted to write a story about was um, people, and it, it happens in Cambodia, and I think it happens all, all over Asia and possibly in other countries, is people who um, go to a country um, and get into the whatever cheap drug is there mm. um especially it's usually some horrific sort of locally made speed or something yeah, and yeah. then sell their passports which is really your you know your you know forget <laughs> about dollars your passport is your you know your key sell their passports to pay for the drugs and then they're stuck and they don't want to go to the embassy because that you know that rings conspiracy and police and stuff and so there's people in cambodia these white men who are street people begging mm. And it's just so confusing. <laughs> Begging from Cambodians or from tourists? Begging from tourists. Right. Yeah. What was that pitch? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always like I need to get to the airport. I've lost my luggage, uh, but right. it's more like I lost my luggage six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and my brain at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, I think there's a question up here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, Laura. Um, I was wondering how do you think uh, Western influences have impacted on, um, I guess, aid work in developing countries? And do you think they've impeded or helped the development process? Uh, I think... I think Thank you for that, because I really love ranting about aid work. Um, I think aid is is really wonderful and um, ca- comes to many countries with the best of intentions, but I also feel that it's a little bit imperialist. I feel there, or the, in, traditionally, there has been a lot of coming into a country and saying, this is how we do mm. aid, pull up your socks, make sure you know your keyboard is this far away, and why haven't you got this report in on time on your broken computer? Um, and whereas now, I think there's a little bit more, um, uh, they call it, monitoring and evaluation, going and talking with communities, going and looking first at, the, at what organisations are actually there, locally and how that you can build them up rather than just coming on in with your big label and your big white car and sort of driving through the villages handing out aid. So my hope is that in answer to your question that it's it's getting better but I haven't been an aid worker for a few years so. I guess I was wondering more about working alongside a a culture where there are these other outside Western influences that might be trying to lead the culture in a different direction that uh, might necessarily be counterproductive to development? I think that in my experience, the development world um, exists almost as a separate entity to, to everything that's happening. I mean, uh, the development workers, aid workers, tend to sort of make their own weird culture. They tend to drink heavily and, and indulge in, you know, the, the wonders that a culture offers. Um, but... In my experience as an aid worker, it it sort of worked alongside and separately and a lot of the issues were with, say, corruption within the government, which may have come from outside influences, such as with Cambodia and its involvement um, with America and the bombs. But um, on a day-to-day basis, I think it's usually just dealing with whatever is happening right there in the culture, if that makes sense. (laughs) Do we have other questions up? Uh, Yep. So there's a couple down the front. Is there a mic here? I think another Hi. one is somewhere in there. Yep. Um, uh, one of my favourite Lonely Planet guides is um, the Indigenous Guide to Australia. And I'm wondering whether um, those 
uh, Indigenous guides uh, travel in travel for travel um, are um, are they sort of becoming a, a lot of a lot of interest um, or They're, are they not? Well, again, I've got to underline that I'm I'm not at Lonely Planet anymore, but increasingly at LP during the years I was there, there was an effort to get more more local involvement in the books that we'd have. A, a writer on it on the on the book who wasn't a an outsider going in, but someone who lived there, or particularly with cultural things where you really wanted some someone who'd lived the culture to um, interpret it and write about it. The um, Indigenous Australia book we did, oh boy, that was a story. I'll tell you, um, it was a nightmare to put together. It was um, it was a highly politically charged operation, mm. and. Um, it, it, was, it was a great book to do. It was a, a total, you know, from a business point of view, it made no sense at all because the, the costs were huge and the, um, the sales were, were not huge. But it, but it was a very interesting window into indigenous culture. And I think a lot of people did, did really appreciate it. We did have a, a lot of um, indigenous work on that book. So it was an, it was an interesting project. And one I'm glad I wouldn't have to repeat, <laughs> ever have to repeat. <laughs> Uh, there was one down here, yep. Uh, Tony, I wanted to thank you uh, for your support of the Wheeler Centre, mate. I think the Wheeler Centre is a treasure of Melbourne. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got to say, though, the Wheeler Centre is, you know, a force of its own, and there's, a, there's some fantastic people, led by Michael Williams, you know, who do, do a great job with it. But, um, you know, it's, it's just, it just exists on its own, and I, I love coming to it. I love it. I had, did I have to put my name up here in order to get invited <laughs> to speak? I, I don't know. But, you know, yeah, I agree, it's great. It is um, great. Mate, you mentioned Afghanistan was perhaps better in the 70s than it is now. Um, do you have a view of other parts of the world that are perhaps better, or that used to be better than they are now? I think a lot of places go up and down, and we sort of look at them and... You know, Afghanistan is a, is a sad story because it's been... And it's, you know, a lot of it's self-inflicted. Um, you know, they, the, the Russians didn't come into Afghanistan, which is what kicked it all off, until they'd created chaos by themselves. So, you know, it's a, it's a sad story. And you can look at lots of other places that have gone up and down over the years. You know, Colombia, which appears in Darklands, is a place that has had a very dark history for a long time, but really is coming out of it today. So places that have been, have been difficult and, and dark have, have got better. Um, but others are, you know, there's no question that they're, they're dark at the moment. And, <coughs> excuse me. And you really can't, I mean, we're seeing this right now today with what's going on in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I can't see any easy answer out of that. And I, well, I went to Iraq, to the Kurdistan region of Iraq, for the previous book, Badlands. I had a great time there. I had a great time in all those countries. But you were uh, all the time observing that things were not, not the way they should be. I think I spied another question here. Yep. Do we have a mic? Another two questions there. Um, somebody said the empire's gone, and I suppose that's true, but it seems to me that the, the melodies linger on. Do you think that should provide a context for the old rip-off and frustration for well, I mean, you know, the, the India is still the the Raj still lives on in all sorts of ways in India, and you can go to hotels in India where you sort of feel that the the Raj has never ended, and there's nostalgia for it as well. It's it's um it's interesting. There, you know, there, lots of countries have nostalgia. You 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 go to the old what used to be East Germany and nostalgia, no, nostalgia for the East is there, and you know the trabants are kept running and. There's also, I'm amazed how many museums there are around the old East Germany, which basically caters to nostalgia for that. Um, you can go to a, you know, restaurants which give you cultural revolutionary food. In, um, I remember coming back to, to China once from North Korea and talking with Chinese about what North Korea was like, and they said, we've got no interest in that at all. If we were old enough, we, were, we know what that was like. <laughs> we, we used to live under that sort of regime. So uh, I think sometimes there's no, not nostalgia for it, but there's memories of the way things used to have been. Mm. And one more here. Excuse me, because my English, I am coming from Barcelona, now I am living here for one year. Do you think you are too much optimistic? 
<laughs> the because I, I w just uh, a short comment. We feel that our city is becoming destroyed for having too much success. And no. we, we have a difficult, uh, for instance, next year there will be the, the local elections and one platform will present people to a struggle a, against this way of tourism. Yeah, you can, I, f I feel like a European that you are too much optimistic. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm pessimistic at times and optimistic at times, but you know, you, the, the places do get loved to death. You know, we, we love them so much that we, we can kill them from that embrace. But the, the place I often point at is Venice, which, you know, is, is, is a town that wouldn't exist without tourism. It's, it's a Disneyland town in many ways. And yet you still go to Venice and St. Mark's Square is overrun by tourists and you get a few blocks away from it and suddenly you're in some little medieval gem of a church and you spend 20 minutes there looking at the icons and the frescoes and the paintings and then you look around and you're the only person there and there's been nobody else has come in for the last 20 minutes they're all over in St. Mark's Square or in, the, in all the shops you know shopping up like crazy and so it, even in the places that are really loved to death and of course Barcelona is a place that is loved to death as well and um, I, can, I can see it's a problem but I, I still go to places which you know, I know there's lots of tourists there, and yet I still think, wow, oh, this is fantastic. This is really good. Mm. And I also think that it's really dangerous to say, oh, you should have come 20 years ago. I was there 20 years ago, and it was wonderful then. <laughs> Look at it now. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's not. And you, you no, there's lots, of, there's lots of empty places in the world still. There's lots of places that would love the tourists to come in and ruin them. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of places in Africa, that would, oh, bring us some ruin. We'd love it. <laughs> Doug, are you too optimistic? Uh, possibly, but I feel like the pessimism spectrum in the bookshelf is already well accounted for. That's so true, that's true. I saw a market opportunity for a bit of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> nice answer. Paul, I mean, right. <laughs> Paul Theroux has got, you know, pessimism down pat. If, you know, if you read a Paul Theroux book and you don't yeah. think, oh, uh, God, yeah, this is awful, Dire. it's not a real Paul Theroux book. No, you have to be left feeling worse about the world. <laughs> But on, on your question, actually, I'm, cur I'm interested in that because I think tourists tend to manufacture these places around them or, or sort of infrastructures built around tourists, but yet locals can still sort of walk between patches of, of tourist areas. And they're kind of these sort of precincts which sort of um, can, to some degree, take over a city. And I've often thought this about Paris. I mean, would you not be extraordinarily grumpy and rude if half the population of France came through your city every year, you know, wanting to see Paris, the city of love, you know? Like, it's, it's perfectly um, acceptable, but in the same way, they kind of almost, uh, to some degree, uh, bubble spaces, you know. So it's almost like you sacrifice your, your top three sites and, like, and you preserve some other area uh, for, for non-tourists, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, Paris, I, I, we lived in Paris for a year once, and quite close to us was a little place that was supposed to have the best ice cream in Paris. So what did they do when, you know, what's the best time of year to eat, eat ice cream? Middle of summer, middle of August? They closed it down. They all went on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was very French, you know. <laughs> we have the best ice cream in Paris. You can't have it. <laughs> I don't think that anybody could accuse me of being optimistic about tourism. <laughs> um, just before we came on, Tony said, oh, I loved your book. I loved the way it was written. But I was so depressing <laughs> I was looking through for a little <laughs> there had to be one upbeat story <laughs> um, but I, I feel that I love travel I, I think about it all the time and I want to do it all the time but I think it's my responsibility as a traveller um, to take it very seriously and to realise that I am a guest um, in, in, this, in other people's worlds and that I need to treat them with a bit of respect and so I, I do flagellate a bit. I do, do sort of, you know, beat myself up a bit um, about travelling. But I think it's really important that we do. Do you know, can I tell an upbeat... Um, an upbeat <laughs> if it, if it Cambodian, only lasts for 30 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> an upbeat Cambodian aid story. I, I, I went we there go. and I met a group of rice scientists. And they were Australian. And, um, the, you know, when the Khmer Rouge came in and scattered everybody around the country, the one thing a farmer always takes with him or her is, the ri is their seed. And they'd all taken their rice seed, and then the Khmer Rouge had put them everywhere in the wrong places. 
So the, the rice from the, the coast ended up in the mountains and from the dry places ended up in the wet places. And the, the, when peace returned, the rice yields never got back to what they were. But just before the Khmer Rouge had come in, these scientists had come in and they'd taken samples from all over the country and taken them off and put them in a deep freeze in Manila. And um, they'd, the, the scientists, these, these rice workers had come, aid workers, had come back, taken the seeds from out of the freezer in Manila, brought them back and taken them back to the right place all around Cambodia. Hmm. And then the rice yields went up because the rice, the right seed was back there. That is a good story, Tony. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> On that happy note, we're going to have to wind up. If you could join me in thanking Tony, Laura, and Doug for being here tonight. Thank you.